like just looking at those two, they do 20 billion each. They need to do they need to do the revenue of those two companies every year for the next 10 years to deliver this project. So like what are was we going to see this massive again? spike? 268 billion. Um, so we're doing like the revenue of every construction company in India combined every year just to deliver this highway scheme. You'd Among expect everything a huge else. spike in that. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the pod. Um, so today, Ollie, you need to get the klaxon sound ready. Um, Jason is on a retreat with the product team. So we have Sam back, um, who was in just, what, two or three episodes ago? Yeah, I think so, yeah. This is your third, sorry, third episode that you're in now. Um, yeah. So Sam, thank you for coming back to the show and uh, stepping in for Jason. Um, no worries. What's the news saying this week? Uh, there were a couple of good ones, but the the one that stood out was the the renderings have dropped for the new stadium um, they're building in Casablanca for the 2030 World Cup. I didn't even I didn't realize who was hosting it, but it's going to be uh, Portugal, Spain, and Morocco are hosting it. I guess due to how well Morocco have been doing in the football, they're going to have a crack at building the world's biggest football stadium, which uh, it's the world's is, uh, biggest. This is the interesting thing. So it says the architects have said it's the world's biggest, but then it says it's potentially the world's biggest. So apparently there's a stadium in Pyongyang, which is about 140,000, but we all know Kim Jong likes to exaggerate a little bit. So <laughs> they don't know the exact size of it. Apparently it's going to, anyway, 115,000 people, which is just nuts. The current oh. stadium that's in Casablanca is... 47,000 people. So it's, you know, it's a bit over double, nearly triple the size of the existing biggest stadium they have. And so the obvious issues there, it's uh, who's going. They're putting the stadium 40 kilometers out of the city next to this tiny little town. There's no public transport out there. <laughs> There's nothing out there. And yeah, they're going to, they're going out to try and build the world's biggest stadium. So I was pretty impressed, but not surprised by the ambition. It seems like this becomes the, um, the a bit of a dick measuring contest, doesn't it? Every time a new World Cup <laughs> comes around to see who can build the world's biggest. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually really happy that an Australian has joined this podcast and mentioned football, because normally I get shot down for Jason if I uh, talk about football as a sport. <laughs> um, yeah, mad that they're building that bigger stadium. Was it 40 miles outside of Casablanca? I've just Googled Casablanca. It's like 3 million population. So that means... Yeah, to be fair, it doesn't seem like it looks like 40 minutes Google Maps, but there's like one road, maybe like two roads. Yeah, out yeah. There. So you imagine but that's like 5% of the population of Casablanca could fit in that stadium. So, like, yeah, and that's going to be empty. Well, I, it sounded crazy, but they're pretty football mad. I think it's like, yeah, it's, they it's are. much a religion there as it is in the UK. So, but here's the really, this is the really shitty thing. Like in classic form, they followed the the like Tottenham way. Only sixty thousand <laughs> seats are for GA, and the rest are all VIPs and boxes. So the GA is at either end, like general admission, and then the rest yeah, of yeah. it is VIP hospitality, which is a bit wow. shit. But yeah, yeah. I really like if they build it. Like the odds have got to be eighty percent that it's going to be derelict after ten years. You'd have to say. Like they surely they can't yeah. they're not going to be able to keep that up. There's enough yeah, yeah. there's enough it, uh, precedence out there for it. I wonder if it's even just for the tournament because yeah, you just it's going to be empty. Nice little Tottenham um, burn in there. That's always right. Yeah. <laughs> I went I went there I went to Morocco back in 2018 and I had uh, just a story of my experience there of how the sort of knee jerk shit that they do. We went to catch a train to go out to an airport and. We got to the train. The train was at three o'clock and we got there at two. The train had gone or it wasn't shown. And we went and asked the attendant, like, oh, you had it. There's a train advertised at three o'clock. Where is it? And they're like, oh, no, the clock's changed for daylight savings. What do you mean? It's it's not on Google. It's like, oh, no, the government ch decided two days ago to change the time. <laughs> I just changed what they were doing for one year. And the people well, looked at us like we were stupid. Like, what do you mean the government changed it? unbelievable yeah i once did a, a thousand kilometer uh, race across morocco on these like really? uh 100 cc monkey bikes across yeah. like the atlas mountains you, so, uh, you by, went across uh, the atlas on monkey bikes like the honda yeah, the yeah. Honda monkeys. yeah yeah uh but uh, yeah, yeah that's a story for another time but yeah 
So our topics for uh, this week. First up, we're going to be talking about uh, India's uh, massively ambitious transport infrastructure plan, um, which is a huge $268 billion. Then we're going to dig into uh, Australia's new energy export, basically the collection of renewable projects that's, that's powering it. Um, and then we'll finish up talking about how uh, Ukraine plans to bolster its damaged energy infrastructure with, I think, a $20 billion um, scheme of sort of renewable energy projects to get their energy back up and running. So um, nice uh, few solid ones on the docket. Um, so first up, yeah, we've spoken quite a lot this year about some large schemes outside of the UK and Oz, like Rail Baltica um, and some of the big transport schemes in America. But uh, yeah, quite shocking to see the scale of some of the schemes outside of the typical regions that we catch in the news. So the NHAI, which is the National Highways Authority of India. So mm -hmm. I guess the equivalent of Highways UK I guess yours is state by state, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so they've set out plans for uh, this highway upgrade, which is $268 billion. And I guess just to give some colors to that. So the timeline, ambitious, 2032, yeah, nah. right? Nah. So we got eight years where they want to build 200,000 kilometers. Uh, sorry, they want to get to a network of 200,000 kilometers. And at, at the moment, they're at like 110,000. So 90,000 kilometers of additional highways. Yeah. They want to do 35,000 kilometers by 2025, which is like, <laughs> yeah, next year away. And I don't think they're very far along that. But they basically got this horrible network issue. And I went to India a couple of years ago. It's very hard to get between cities. Uh, it's lots of small winding roads. So they're building a series of highways or super highways that can connect the major cities across the country. And, and the crazy stat was 15% of GDP is the cost of logistics, which is like, if you think about 15% of GDP is just transporting goods across the country. So wow. yeah, pretty massive scheme. Yeah. How many $300 billion highway schemes are there in us? <laughs> yeah, I know it's uh, uh, for all of these. Uh, I love with these international projects, you just instantly go and snap to fire out. We spend a lot of money here in Australia on trying to do things. Um, you know, how, how likely it is that they get this done is like remains to be seen. It's pretty ambitious. I think, I didn't uh, work out how many football stadiums or Olympic swimming pools it was, but the distance of of a uh, national highway, like high speed network, was I think it said eighteen thousand kilometers, and yeah. the total the total highway network in Australia is nineteen thousand. So they're trying to build like the equivalent <laughs> of all the new highway in Australia in eight years, which is just. Crazy. Even if they even if they tipped half that, that's something that we could never even come close to doing here. Which is just I don't know. I think it shows it shows how much red tape we run, you know, in Oz and I imagine, you know, really the UK at going out and getting something done. Yeah, I think like just the labor and labor plant materials factor alone, like you just can't understand how they could be doing that. Get the raw um, goods to in, put in it the, together. Yeah. In that amount of time, obviously countries. So if you if you look at like the biggest ever construction schemes, there's obviously the trans-European network that we spoke about previously. Yeah, that's like split up across every country in the EU. So like it seems manageable because it like bite-sized chunks. Yeah, China's done some pretty crazy schemes. So there's the national trunk highway system where they're basically all roads lead to China across Europe and Asia. You kind of get it with India and China due to population. Manpower is probably not the issue. It's probably transporting goods to site and trying to... Because they um, they go out and they source their manpower from like neighboring countries and like I know they go out into Indonesia and they put work contracts together. People are coming from all over the world to do this. So you think they're ready yeah. to go out and source that. But I just, the raw material to build, you know, that much road, just nuts. Yeah, you wonder if it's like the same grade as like a super highway here. Like, are they using different types of aggregates and just compacting them rather than doing like blacktop that you would in? Um, it'd be interesting yeah. to see the like the spec. To be fair, the way they're looking at it is get the road down. It's going to solve the problem, even if it's you know you lose twenty years on doing a ship build. It's still better to get that road in there. And because I mean, I haven't been there, but by all accounts, it's a you know, it's fairly underdeveloped for the size of population they have. So um, you can see why the investment's there. Yeah, for sure. Interesting to see what they can get done. I was looking into the, like, the top contractors in India. So Larson and Torbro, they are the biggest. They do like 20 Where are they billion. From? Or they're the, so Larson and Torbro and uh, Adani Group are both um, Indian, I believe. They're both yep. around the 20 billion revenue mark. Yeah. 
looks like Larson and Torbo have their own labor because they've got 340,000 employees. So I'd imagine they self deliver. <laughs> but like just looking at those two, they do 20 billion each. They need to do they need to do the revenue of those two companies every year for the next 10 years to deliver this project. So like what are we going to see this massive again? spike? 268 billion. Um, so we're doing like the revenue of every construction company in India combined every year just to deliver this highway scheme. You'd Among expect everything a huge else. spike in that. Yeah. So Mad, I don't know if... like that wind energy programs like. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not got the entire industry. Like... Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen or didn't come across any sort of foreign contractors or the, the big European contractors or anyone going in and doing any major work. So it'd be interesting to see how they're actually going to yeah, keep well, some, up the volume of work. Yeah, someone's going to have to gear up for it. So, um, but I mean, if the cash is there, people will come. So it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, that general rule of thumb works most places. But uh, yep. yeah, no, interesting one. Massive scheme. We'll definitely keep an eye on it. So a few weeks ago, and conveniently, it was one of the episodes you were in on. We talked through that list of sort of energy schemes across the world. Yeah. And one of those that we touched on was um, in Australia and Northern Territories. They've got these giant renewable energy farms to produce power. And uh, they're going to be sending energy to Asia, uh, more specifically, I think, Singapore. Yeah. It's called the uh, a Australia Asia Power Link. And I guess just to dig into a few details to give it some context. So the solar farm in the Northern Territory, you're going to know way more than me on this, uh, in Darwin is 12,000 hectares. That's massive. To go back to our, what is now a fairly useful stat, 9,000 yeah. football pitches. <laughs> to, to sort of see what that you looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it was 20 gigawatt of solar energy being captured and like 40 gigawatt of battery storage. They're then laying a cable on the seabed across to Singapore, which is over 4,000 kilometers and is by far the longest undersea cable. Um, and basically will power 15% of Singapore's energy needs. So yeah, um, you'll probably know a lot more than me on this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely like a project of stats. Uh, I think it said that it would have the same, it would power the same like energy output as all of New South Wales year by year. Um, it has the same, it's going to export every year the same value as the whole of the dairy industry, which is massive. So wow. truly like monumental job. I think uh, it, it used to be called Sun Cable. I don't know if they've changed the name or they've split it up. It's fairly well known, I'd say, across Australia just because it came out in the woodwork probably four or five years ago. The guy who, who was, uh, do you know Twiggy Forest, like the mining magnet over here? He, um, so he was involved with it. And then there was Mike Cannon Brooks, who was one of the Atlassian founders. And he, right, they yeah. were, so they ended up buying one or the other out. Um, so Mike Cannon Brooks was like heading it up now where he was in part of an investment group. And so they've got this approval now. So yeah, it's a fairly well known project. I looked into, because you asked the question last time and it interests me around how the cable works like how the hell would they run that sort of cable and it looks insane like, like, uh, now, does it lose power as you go like how efficient yeah is so it to transport? it's it's the main issue is about the sizing of the cable which is what you were getting at there's a heap of background and experience in laying subsea cable not sure if the like what they're trying to do here they're going to be i imagine it's going to be a custom size conductor but Interestingly, they need to, they're going to have to do a full survey of the seabed, like, because it's all affected by what it gets buried in. I just thought they laid the cable on the seabed, but they have a, a trowel that digs it in about a meter and a half to three meters oh, down really? on the seafloor. And so I always wondered what all the environmental groups were losing their minds over, you know, oh, like you just lay a cable <laughs> on the floor, it's just a bit of dust. <laughs> it's like they're dragging this plow through the ocean, just absolutely destroying the seabed um right. you know it's a good thing like singapore is a massive center of population that it's not like they're going anywhere so they need power and why not we've got a heap of space we can build a big solar farm it's a i like the ambition we don't usually go for the ambitious things in australia so it's good to see yeah for sure i had no idea that they actually dig a trough is that sorry to sound really potentially stupid but it's a lot of coral around there right like we're doing serious damage to like, I know the Barrow Reef is a bit further east, but um, yeah, yeah. we're going, well, like it's going yeah, in between, it's, it's going straight through Indonesia, right? 
Uh, yeah, so it, it's their water and it looks like they're getting some supply out of the deal, which would make sense. Like if I was Indonesia, I'd be like, well, if you can fucking dig through my backyard, I'll take some free power. But yeah, uh, yeah. I read the approvals are still pending. It'd be like Aboriginal heritage as well. I imagine that whole area there, like they're going to be digging through fairly sensitive waterways. So I imagine there's going to be a lot more, you know, outside of, just the approval they've got now because yeah digging a big trench through the seafloor doesn't sound yeah. great and why singapore is australia met its energy needs or is it because singapore will pay them more per gigawatt like i think uh i think the issues a lot of the issues in australia is the getting the grid i don't think we have an issue with space is that we don't really have the infrastructure to transport that level of um energy and then distributed around Oz. So right. I think that they, they can work out because Singapore's so, you know, such a small land area that like Singapore just don't have the land area to make the renewables, which is why they're buying it elsewhere, is what I've read. So I guess yeah, yeah. there's a dollars and cents argument that we can make it here in Oz or produce it and send it there, which is crazy to think because you're right, we need it as well. Yeah. So Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, you say, oh, do we have the ability to like, yeah, transmit that energy, but someone somewhere has decided that a 4,000 kilometer seabed cable is the most efficient way to get, <laughs> to get that power across. So yeah, I guess if Singapore uh, paying for it, uh, they obviously don't have the space for that. It's tiny. So yeah. um, we have a yeah. pretty dark, dark history with um, how we buy and sell and develop energy in Australia. So I'm sure it's, um, it's not a great, it's not the best result for Australia. It's definitely, um, there's investors involved, so it's got to make sense dollar-wise. So, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it'll be makes good sense. to see. I mean, I think there's. it's good that we're doing ambitious things and they're getting pushed through government because, you know, otherwise there's no chance we're going to come close to, this will open the door to other sort of energy development projects and which is where we need to head to hit 2050 targets. Yeah, okay. And um, from a construction point of view, is all the money in like the manufacturing of the solar panels and the laying of the cable, do you think? Or is there thousands of people that's got to go work in the middle of nowhere? It's near Darwin, right? It's not the biggest or most populated area. Or is that me being naive? It's, I think it's, it's only maybe three, 400,000 people there, but it's a town. There was a big uh, offshore gas project there. And so it's a town that's used to having like fly in, fly out workers. So okay. there'll be no issue manning up for it. I actually don't know. Like there'll be a lot of workers to build, you know, install that many solar panels. It's a lot of cable to run. Um, but I think the cable laying, you know, once it's manufactured on the boat, it's just like boats pulling those cables along. It's just a matter of time. So it'll get a lot of people out there. But, you know, when you break it into its small pieces, it's probably not that interesting a job. But as a whole, it's sort of, you know, a very interesting project, the, the purpose of it. Yeah, but it's yeah. just repeated. I don't think they're doing, I can't imagine they're doing anything engineering wise, which hasn't been done a hundred times before. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good. Right. So on to uh, the last topic. So obviously we're all aware of uh, the conflict going on in Ukraine. Um, most of the focus like news wise is on obviously the developments of the war with Russia, um, but huge amount of damage has been done to the infrastructure of the country. Um, particularly related to uh, energy supply, which is, I think is predominantly nuclear power plants. Uh, but there's news out at the moment, which is effectively saying to fill the gap in energy supply, uh, Ukraine's looking to invest uh, $20 billion um, into renewable energy, which is great to see for any country going through what Ukraine is going through to still have the mindset of renewable energy is a really nice thing to see rather than just doing the quick and dirty of firing up coal power stations. Yeah. I'm sure it's not as easy as me just saying, yeah, just fire up the coal power stations, but like it's great <laughs> to see that that's still front of mind. Um, yeah. So a couple of targets uh, for some context. They want to go, uh, so they want to decarbonize the energy sector completely by 2050, and they want to completely phase out coal uh, by 2035. So a couple of like key steps to get to their carbon yeah. um, objective. Um, and then the actual renewables themselves that they're going to be focusing on um it looks like the biggest is wind 140 gigawatts pretty pretty substantial um yeah. and i think they're focused around uh it's the red sea or the dead sea uh, i'm gonna say I'm the black. Guess, uh, black sea yeah. <laughs> <laughs> neither of those the black sea yeah. uh so yeah lots of wind uh there's 80 gigawatts of solar so substantial and then some of the smaller stuff 
um, was around hydroelectric and uh, yeah, pump storage and um, hydro hydrogen production. And I think they're planning on exporting hydrogen to to Europe or back to the EU. So um, yeah, yeah, pretty pretty impressive that they've got these these goals in mind while they're going through what they're going through. Yeah. But um, yeah, what's your what's your thoughts? Yeah, when I read it, it just you often forget or it make it reminds you that they're still running a country like in the midst of everything you just sort of see the news and those aspects and you think that's everything but you still like they've still got to run a country like they still got to you know work towards what's going to happen when they get to the other side so yeah it's really good to see did they have any stats in there around their current nuclear production because i i understood there was that they're currently running a heap of from nuclear power anything in there I couldn't see anything I'm, uh, in it. I'm, I'm yeah. Googling as we Quickly speak. Good. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm sure they see because, you know, every time a nuclear facility gets attacked, like, you know, that just such a huge hampering input on supply that it would be, uh, it would be really scary to, uh, without these alternatives in place. Um, you just got to wonder though, how, like, how would you go about tendering this work? Like, how would you go about actually making this happen in the middle of the war? I just can't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to answer your first question, at the moment, they're 55% nuclear, so quite substantial. Yeah. And then yeah. I remember the news, actually towards the beginning of the conflict, is that huge nuclear power station that was taken over. And there was a yeah. huge concern that obviously, I don't know, yeah. some sort of explosive would do some serious damage. Yeah. But it's an interesting point in terms of, obviously, it makes a ton of sense, not just because of the carbon aspect, but to build energy, which has not got the natural dangers of nuclear but just finding supply chain labor plant bringing goods in like it's hard to imagine the logistical challenges they're actually going to have with building this yeah and it'll be really difficult to you'd imagine pull in international contractors because if they're thinking about the safety and well-being of their employees it's a high a high risk um country to go to at the moment so i mean there would be expect... there would be plenty of big companies out there that would tackle it but it's you know when you start to dive into it there must be you know specialized contractors around the world that are geared up with like procedures that they have in place for providing security for doing construction work in fairly you know tough environments because you imagine that you know not everything shut down, like, you know, in other areas of Ukraine, they're, they're probably still working in a lot of places. Yeah, So I know construction's way behind on tech, but there is a lot of tech in place. You wonder if some of these international contractors could actually run jobs without being in the country. Yeah, you, right. You could, you could, right? You could locally source labor, you could purchase materials, and you could run a project remotely. So I wonder if that's something that's been considered yeah, definitely. Like you think about the like, there'd be just so much upfront procurement on a lot of these wind jobs. Same with the solar panels. Like you could secure that, go and clear the area, and then you just come in and knock it up. You really wonder like where are these discussions happening, and like what is like realistic outcomes? Because they've said, you know, these are all the things that they've said, and they're putting this information together. But it'll be interesting to see how they go about doing it. Because like, if you know, you put the challenge to me, I'm like, I, I wouldn't even know where would you start, like. Um, how would you go yeah. and get this work done? Just Is imagine the boat, boats turn up with a wind turbine, you open up the old IKEA manual and you just you just whip it yeah, up. Yeah, just whack it together. <laughs> Plug it in. <laughs> uh, Is there... That is a good question. This is where uh, Olu can add in some elevator music while I'm Googling this. So, um, <laughs> Ukraine. I wonder as well if there's some, not pressure, but like, they have their own obligation. They're looking to, um, they're looking to enter NATO, and you know this is part of like their process. Like that, they have to sort of meet these barriers as part of yeah. entering the European Community. <laughs> this is so far outside of any expertise that I've ever had. Uh, but you'd expect <laughs> in a war zone, the military has some capability with engineers to be able to get power up, back up, and running because like countries will fall apart, right? So. Um, there yeah. must be some expertise that would help there. Um, I can't seem I mean, to see a timeline, just to confirm. Yeah, it's like what, what we say in Australia with our renewables targets. It's a loose plan, but it's uh, good to see. I think, I mean, the whole, the military has the whole engineering arms. And so when you were talking about it, like the typical thing came to mind was, you know, like the British military had, you know, their own engineering division. And so in, you know, war zone, they'd go in and build bridges, get power supply, yeah. supply to all the areas. 
And so you imagine that there's that sort of contingent, but they're sort of, you know, they're like, I imagine they're makeshift. They're not building permanent, you know, long-standing structures or like renewable energy projects. So you think yeah, there's it's like probably a, the equivalent of like temporary temporary works and construction projects, like temporary lighting, temporary power. That's yeah. probably their their bread and butter rather than permanent structures. Yeah. Wicked. Right. Sam, thank you very much for stepping in for Jason today. Really enjoyed that. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning into today's show. Um, if you did enjoy today's episode, please do think about liking the video or following us on your chosen podcast platform. Um, we really do appreciate your support um, and catch you all next week. Yeah.